Hey, welcome and thanks for watching our little presentation about Fiverr, Sony Pictures Imageworks' new in-house hair and fur grooming software. I am Daniela Hasenbrink, a principal software engineer at Imageworks, and my co-presenter is Henrik Carlsen, our head of CFX department. One thing first, while Fiverr is being used as a primary grooming tool in all our current ongoing projects, unfortunately none of them are released yet, and therefore we can't show you any final images. But we are doing our very best to showcase everything with what we are allowed to show. All right, let's start and talk about Fiverr. As I had mentioned, it is our new grooming software that I've written from scratch over the last couple of years. Our previous in-house tool, Kami, served us really well for over 20 years, but with that age, we needed something new to keep up with modern demands, especially in regards to performance and user-friendliness. So we decided to write Fiverr, a fully standalone node-based application that you can see on the screen right now. It has a node graph at the bottom left, an attribute editor on the right, and a viewport to see what you're currently doing on the top left. When you select the node, you can change its parameters in the attribute editor. In this example, I'm changing the count, length, and area size of the hair square node that I like to use for demo purposes. As you can see, you get instant feedback of what you're doing in the viewport. Nodes that you can view in the viewport have a little box in the top right corner, so simply just click it to view the node in the viewport. The node I'm viewing right now is a band node, which just uh, bends hair by a given amount. And as you can see in the node graph, I have a pearl noise connected to its band value parameter. If I break that connection, you'll see how all hair is bent in the exact same way, whereas if I reconnect it, the noise will be applied to the bent value again. And you can see how it breaks up the band as I move the slider around. Next up we have a rotate node, which I'm using to break up the band a little more sideways. The viewport uses OpenGL with geometry shaders to render the hairs as smooth-looking Cadmore rom ribbons in real time, but we also implemented a live Arnold Ray Trace renderer to give better visual feedback if needed. It behaves the same way as the OpenGL viewport, so you can navigate the scene or change parameters and still get instant visual feedback of your changes. My machine right now has 32 cores, so not one of our best. Also, there is no RTX graphics card and therefore GPU acceleration. But with the price of a button, you can go back and forth between the two different viewports seamlessly. Changes you make on one side are respected on the other and vice versa. Since it's a node-based system, you can view your groom at different nodes at any time. So just click the little box on the node again and you can see it in the viewport. While Fiber is a standalone application, I designed and written it in a way where the code for the user interface is fully separated from the code that handles the computations and data. We call this part the Fiber Engine. Fiber Engine can be used to integrate Fiber into any third-party application we like. Currently, we are using it in Maya, Katana, and Houdini. In Maya, for example, we use it to visualize grooms that are done by grooming artists in our animation scenes. This allows animators to see the hair in their viewports, in their play plus, or even to deform it with guide curves or mesh inputs. But Henrik will talk more about it later. Fiber's node graph flows from left to right and offers great flexibility. So, for example, a split node can be used to separate a given percentage of input hairs into two different outputs. In this case, I'm splitting about 50% of all hairs into output A and the other 50% into output B. Take a look at the hair count that is displayed in the bottom right corner of the viewport as I switch between the nodes. I'm connecting each of the two outputs to a band node, one that bends them to the left and one that bends them to the right. And finally, I'm merging everything back together in the merge node. And as you can see, we can change the parameters in the upstream nodes while viewing it from the merge. Of course, we can also connect the node to the percentage parameter in the split node, so you could connect the mask node, a texture, or pretty much any other network that you like. In this case, I keep it simple and I'm just using a checkerboard for demo purposes. As you probably noticed already, some nodes have different colors. Green nodes are what we call effect nodes. They compute hair and usually have at least one hair output parameter. They are nodes like, for example, the bend and rotate node that you saw earlier already, which operate on given input hairs. So they take hairs, deform them, and then output them on the other side. Other nodes, like for example the hair square node, will generate completely new hair. In Fiber, there is no difference between guide hairs and final hairs. Every green node and connection you see is simply what I call a hair buffer. The cool thing about it is, if you're a groom artist and are fairly happy with your groom, but only need a few more hairs in a specific area, you could very easily use some of your final hairs as guide input to an instance node to instance new hairs right in that specific spot. Next up we have our math nodes. Those are the yellow ones you've seen earlier already. They do simple math operations like plus, minus, multiply, but can also be things like an f-curve to change values along a hair, as well as textures and masks. The follow from center hair node, for example, will output the distance of the follicle to its closest center hair. Or the checkerboard node, as another example, will output a black or white value depending on the follicle's UV coordinate. Color and vector nodes work and behave very similar to math nodes. The only difference really is to compute float three vectors instead of single float values, but otherwise they are the same. Red nodes are what we call geometry nodes. 
The output triangulated meshes that can be used by nodes like the instance effect to generate hair on it. The component reader node is what we use to bring published characters into Fiber. It reads the alembic file, triangulates it, and then optimizes the mesh for use in Fiber on the fly. Next, we have a bunch of nodes that don't fit into any other category. On the left, we have I.O. nodes that we use to input and output hairs or mesh data from third-party applications into the Fiber node graph. In the middle column, we have nodes like the group node. It is automatically created when you select a bunch of nodes in your node graph and hit Ctrl G to group them. Or the reference nodes can be used to reference an existing Fiber file in a current work file, similar to Maya references. And last but not least, we have backdrop nodes. They don't have any real functionality and are purely for helping to organize the node graph better. All right, let's talk about how all the data is managed under the hood. Fiber uses a mix between push and pull to transfer data from one node to another, depending on what kind of data it is. Complex data like hair buffers and meshes are transferred via push. That means a node does its computations and then sends the data to the next downstream node. If there is only one node connected downstream, the data will be moved, so no extra memory allocations are required. If there are more than just one downstream node connected, the data will be moved to one of them and then copied to all the others. That way we can make sure to have as few memory allocations as possible for maximum performance. Simple data, on the other hand, like floats and colors, use a pull mechanism instead. That means that the output of a math node is computed on the fly whenever a node requests it. A compute graph is generated on the fly in the background and contains only the nodes and connections required for the current output. That way we can ensure that no data is ever computed or copied over unnecessarily. Here's a little example of how geometry nodes work. On the left, we have a component reader that simply loads a cube from an alembic file. We connect the output to a smooth mesh node and subdivide it into a sphere, and then can use a face select node to select specific faces. And as you can see, the original topology is maintained to make sure the hair computations are always based on the original face IDs and UVs. That way, we can modify the mesh upstream without causing reinstancing issues further downstream. One of the main reasons why we developed Fiber was because we wanted to have faster performance for all computations. So Fiber is heavily multi-threaded. All computations are automatically split into chunks that can be computed in parallel. Certain operations are also done on a GPU with the use of OpenCL. But since most of our render farm is currently still CPU-based, we wanted to make sure the CPU paths are as fast as possible. Since most crooms only take a second or two to compute, we can compute them on the fly during render time in Katana, and no baking or final hair should ever be needed. As I mentioned earlier, we implemented Fiber Engine into Maya, Katana, and Houdini. And since we wanted to be able to modify groups in those applications rather than just viewing them, we came up with something that we call parameter promotion. You can right-click any parameter to promote them and give them custom names. In this example, I'm promoting the count and the length parameters of the hair square node, as well as the time parameter of the noise node. Try to remember how the hair changes when I move the sliders around. In the end, I also create a hair output node, which defines a point in the node graph where I can grab the hair for visualization and other applications. From a technical point of view, we don't really need all of this, since Fiber Engine can take the hair at any point we like. But it makes it easier for artists to define specific locations and parameters they want to expose for other departments to use. Let's jump over to Katana now, where I'm creating a Fiber node and pointed to my Fiber file that I just saved. Once done, we will see the hair output and the three parameters that are promoted in the Parameters tab on the right. If I now expand the scene graph locations, I will get a live preview in the Katana viewport. And when changing any of the three promoted parameters, you will see that everything behaves the exact same way as it did inside Fiber. And even though it looks and behaves the same as in Fiber, on the Katana side, it is written to the scene graph location as regular Katana curve geometry. It's the same deal in Maya. I brought in my Fiber scene with some custom Fiber nodes and have the same hair output and promoted parameters here as well. Everything is computed under the hood with Fiber Engine on the fly and rendered to the viewport using Fiber's OpenGL viewport renderer. So everything looks and behaves exactly the same as if it were inside Fiber UI. All right, and with that I will hand it over to Henrik so he can talk some about a few of our nodes from an artist's perspective. Thank you, Daniela. I'm going to go over a few different workloads and node structures within Fiber. And as mentioned, it will be geared more towards an artistic approach instead. First up is the mask node. This is the node that we utilize to paint maps within Fiber. So here we're starting to paint in screen space mode, which is more useful in some cases, but it may lead to mushy texture at corners of the mesh. This is because we're projecting the strokes from the camera onto the mesh itself. We can switch to 3D space though, which will sort out any stretching issues we'd have from painting in screen space, as we're factoring in the shape of the mesh while painting. Once you enter paint mode for the mask node, 
any hotkeys available are listed in the top left corner of the screen. For instance, you hold down V and drag left or right to resize, or hold down V to increase value. We can switch between any existing brushes, and we can also easily add our own brushes by simply saving them down into a library. Painting is additive upon release, so once you release the button and start painting again, it will add on top of existing paint in case it's below a value of 1. We can also paint in inverse by holding down control as we paint. There's a hide hair button on the mask node, which will hide the hair if checked, or unhide if unchecked. Hiding hair can be really useful, as the hair tends to obstruct the map, but likewise, sometimes you don't really care what the map looks like. Instead, you want to visualize the end result on the hair itself. We haven't mapped this to hotkey yet, but it's on our immediate to-do. You can also hold down Shift while painting to get a live update rather than update upon release. And if you hold down Shift and Control at the same time, it will live update while painting in inverse. We also have an undo stack so that we can revert any paint strokes that we don't like or may have done by accident. And similarly, we can also use redo on any paint strokes that we undid, in case we did a few too many. Clumping is one of the basic operators in any grooming system. The way we approached it in Fiber was by splitting it into two separate nodes. We have a simple center hair node and an actual clump node. As you can see in the video, I quickly go into the pink node, the simple center hair node. This is where we set the radius of the clump and we pass in the center hairs. Then I'll go into the green node, which is where we control the shape of the clump itself. We can utilize what we call an F-curve, which essentially is just a curve where the root is on the left and the tip is on the right. We use the F-curve to set up the shape that we want for the clump. So for this groom, we're doing a tight and a loose F-curve. We then control which area is loose and tight by utilizing the mask node that I showcased earlier. We're controlling the profile attribute for the shape of the clump. So even if the profile is zero, the clump will still have a cylindrical shape following the center curve. But if the value is above one, the clump will tighten up to either follow the center curve exactly or mimic what your F-curve looks like. If you want to disable clumping completely, you need to adjust match shape instead, which acts like an envelope and can also take F-curves as an input. We also have two different clump algorithms, one which is called parallel, which gives you round clumps, and one called directional, which gives you flat clumps. We can also use parallel twist and rotate the member hairs around the center hairs. We can pass out unclumped hairs in a separate output, but we can also leave them included in the regular output. You can set the percentage of hairs you want to be unclumped, and any values you add to your center hairs can also be inherited to your member hairs. So in this case, we're adding a debug color node to assign random colors to the center hairs and inheriting them to the member hairs, which is very useful for debugging. Any further edits on the center hairs would pass along in a similar fashion, such as curl in this case. One of the things we want to do with Fiber is decouple the groom from the simulation curves. So in the past, we've always been held to using our control curves in the dyne setup and the groom and make sure that they match. With fiber, we want to be able to arbitrarily upress the simulation at any point without having to update the groom or without that actually affecting and changing the groom. We also want to be able to use the workflows for ingest from any other facilities, and that's something we've already started doing. The hair wrap itself takes three inputs. There's final hairs, dynamic guide curves, and static guide curves. Once you've fed it these three, there are four different bind modes. There's closest based on root point, there's closest per CV, and then there's also both of them as normalized options. Once the bind is set up, it's really quick, it's real time on all head hairs, and it's real time on most, if not all of our creatures. The one thing we need to improve further is that we need to pass more data than we are right now, such as clump information, and start utilizing that to calculate breakup. But overall, it's working really well. One of the first problems we faced in Fiber was a horse. Specifically on the show Mulan, the character was called Blackwind. This was our initial target show for Fiber, and the reason why we picked this show was because grooming a horse 
while it may sound simple, would have been really difficult in our old groom system. We needed a really high quality groom as it had to hold up for close up scrutiny. Because of that, we needed hair on the body of the horse rather than just a texture solution. In our old system, we would need an obscene amount of curves to get the details necessary for this. In fiber though, we wrote a shrink wrap node that would suction the hair down to the body, and that way we would get all the details we need with a minimal amount of curves to dictate direction and length. There's a few different options available for the shrink wrap node. So there's an offset that will essentially take the shrink wrapped hair and move it away from the body while retaining the shape of the shrink wrapped hair. We can also use the smoothing attribute because by default the mesh itself is not smooth within fiber, which means we may end up with faceted hair. While the result was good and we got a lot of detail out of it, it wasn't enough. And while modeling had given us a really high res model, they needed a lot more veining and folds on top of that. So they added the displacement layer, which means we need to factor the displacement into the shrink wrap node itself. Adding the displacement as an option didn't actually add a lot of overhead. While loading the displacement is slow, the actual shrink wrap node itself isn't impacted. When loading the displacement, the quality in the final product is much higher. We get a lot of folding and wrinkling practically for free. Um, as we didn't add any more curves or put any more work into the groom. Once you render this, you can really see the difference with all the dents and divots showing up perfectly with all the hairs going over them. We also leveraged the offset value to create more bumps and divots on the groom on our end, not needing to go back to modeling to get them to add more detail into the displacement. With the displacement loaded once, you can easily enable and disable the displacement to see the difference, as the switch will be virtually instantaneous when it's been loaded once. You can still use any of the settings we used prior to adding the displacement, such as the offset and the smooth. We can also use something we call a blend, which will take the hair and blend it back to the original starting position, essentially ignoring the shrink wrap node. Um, this is something you can use to turn the wrap off in certain sections where you might not want it. We have a fiber viewer for Maya. It allows you to visualize either static, bound, or dynamic hair within Maya. It's something we use within CFX, but also something that animation or other departments can use to visualize the hair. As Daniela showcased earlier, the hair viewer comes with any promoted attributes from the groom. In this particular case, that's just a basic width, density, and length multiplier, but you can technically promote the entire groom if it's necessary for a specific character. In this file, I've already set it up so the dynamic curves within the file are driving the final hair. If you deform the curves, they will affect the hair. And the way we use this within our pipeline is for a couple of things. We use it to visualize final hair as we're editing curves, which is really useful for cleanup. We also use it for play blasting hair out of the simulation file, which will give a better visualization of the final hairs. We have an automated process manager that will kick off a play blast with the hair viewer connected to the curves by default. This happens upon animation publishes so that we can visualize the hair prior to even assigning it out to, to the artists. This also allows animation to run part of our pipeline to visualize the hair before handing final animation off to us, as they can kick off the same process manager on their end. Once you have the play blast, you end up with something that looks like this, although normally we use the actual hair color on the character itself rather than this root to tip. One of the cool things we have access to in Fiverr is Arnold. We have an in-house Arnold team that has helped us integrate Arnold into Fiverr. By default, we work in OpenGL mode, which is what we're seeing right here. But the Arnold team has given us access to a real-time GPU renderer and a few different shading modes. The first one is image occlusion, which is arguably the most useful shading mode for grooming. This mode will allow us to visualize hair details easier than OpenGL mode, by default, it only updates upon release, but it can be changed to interactive mode. That way it will update as the values are being edited. 
So as you can see, it's very quick to resolve. So you can actually work in this mode within Fiverr if that's your preference. You can also tweak the level of detail settings to speed it up further. So for instance, you can pick which number of AA samples to use. And there's also a denoise option that will mush the hair ever so slightly, but it will allow you to work in lower AA samples with the hair still looking decent. There are two more shading modes on top of this. There's fast and simple, which you can see right now. And there's also full shading mode. And the full shading mode uses the same shader that looked at does within Katana. You have the same parameter options that they have access to. We've also added access to max light bounces on top of that, which you can lower to help speed up the renderer further within Fiber. This is useful for really light colored hair, which tends to be slower to calculate. Once you have all this set up, what you can do is you can add a texture to the hair and then you can play blast the hair in a turntable through fiber or through a shot camera. That way you don't have to go into Katana to render the end product. Instead, you can present your fiber render directly to the VFX soup or your supervisor. Eventually, we will move into this workflow within a shot context as well. However, we're not really there yet. Well, we can already play blast any shot data, as you will see in the end of this video as well. We don't have the pipeline to fully automate that yet. Uh, the hope is that we can stay more and more within Fiber and not have to go into Katana and rely on that to render the end product. And these are really quick from within Fiber. They only take a few minutes at most. And then most of that time is spent writing the data to disk. Thanks a lot, Henrik. And before we end this presentation, I'd like to talk about two more nodes. First of all, the hair select mode. Basically, it's a very simple node. It gives the user tools to select hairs in a viewport, but the implementation was actually way more tricky than it seems on the first glance. For one, I wanted the selection feedback to be instant, no matter how many hairs we have. Secondly, I wanted the selection to work based on the actual smooth cut ROM ribbons that you see in the viewport, rather than just a line. And since we generate the ribbon geometry on the fly with geometry shaders, it would have been fairly expensive to do the same computation on the CPU for proper selection, especially once you have millions of hairs. So I came up with a way where I'm doing the dissection check with the mouse position inside the OpenGL geometry shader, and I'm returning a list of primitives that were hit back to the CPU via OpenGL transform feedback. So once the user clicks on the screen, I'm calling the geometry shader with the mouse position. Then the geometry shader converts the input curve geometry into smooth cut mode ROM ribbons, does the check if the mouse position is over one of the generated triangles, and if it is, it puts the primitive ID into a list. That list is then read back on the CPU side and used to figure out what hair got selected. The same happens if the user does a marquee selection, just with the difference that all hairs that are inside the rectangle will be selected, rather than just the closest one to the camera. So while the theory of a hair select node is very simple, this is a good example to show how much effort we put into making everything as fast as possible for maximum performance and best user experience. The other node I'd like to highlight is the Sculpt node. It is currently in development, therefore isn't being used much in production yet. The idea behind it is to groom hair with artistic brush-like tools. So in this example here I'm combing the hair and as you may see there's a clear reason why I'm not an artist, but I hope you get the idea of what I'm trying to show anyway. Everything is happening in screen space at the moment, so when I cut the hair with the cut tool, you will see everything is cut off perfectly on that line. What makes this node special is, it is recording all the brush strokes you do. That means I can go back in the node craft to my instance node for example, and change the numbers of hairs it generates. The node will play with all the recorded strokes I did, and the result looks the same, no matter if I now have less or more hairs in CVs than originally. Of course it has its limitations if you deform the incoming hair too much, but it comes in real handy at times where you want to make slight modifications upstream without needing to redo your artistic work. Last but not least, I want to talk about debugging in Fiverr. Every once in a while, especially during early development, we were encountering issues where the hair flips or behaves weirdly during animation. One thing I decided upon very early was to save a tangent and bi-tangent for every CV in Fiverr that can be modified by nodes if needed. That ensures a very stable coordinate system for all deformations, but if there ever happens to be an issue with them, we can visualize them easily inside Fiber. Since a lot of things are also based on the UV coordinates and normals of the mesh, we also have options to visualize those right inside Fiber. And with that, we're at the end of our presentation. Thank you very much for watching, and if you happen to have any questions, please come by to our Q&A session during SIGGRAPH or just send us an email. And as you probably noticed already, this is a pre-recorded presentation. So I can now play a video that shows a bit of the workflow in Fiber without any commentary. You of course don't have to watch it, there's nothing coming after. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye bye!